So here I am sharing our very first official summer holiday on our 57 foot narrowboat. I'll be showing you how me, my husband and tri-border collie Hans travelled from Doncaster, South Yorkshire, all the way to Shipley, West Yorkshire and back again. This round trip took 11 days with some obstacles in the way. But what encouraged us to book some time off was that we'd recently had some Victron solar panels fitted, new batteries and a rear cratch cover. We're still waiting for the front one to be made, which is why you'll only see the framework on the front at the moment. Also, the weather forecast was glorious, but as usual, two days before we were due to leave, it drastically changed and what we really got were overcast skies, muggy temperatures, lots of rain, thunder and lightning. Anyway, our starting point was the Stainforth and Keedby Canal heading for South Bramoth, spelt Bramwith. Stainforth is an ex-mining village and if you moored up and walked behind the towpath area, you'll still be able to see the Hatfield Colliery. Lots of Geordies, including my granddad's family in the 1930s, moved here and to the nearby villages to work at this mine. And apparently a Geordie accent was the most common in the area. Also, if you're traveling through, not far past the Newin pub on the left, just behind there on a Sunday is a small car boot and market, which is often selling cheap fruit and veg, bacon sarnies, or secondhand bargains if that's your thing. By the way, I'll be timestamping this video so you can go back and forth and leave your map locations if it helps. After passing through Stainforth under the bridge, you'll head towards what we find a very peaceful part called South Bramoth. Alongside it on the right, behind the hedgerow, is the River Don, which is a great dog walk when the cows aren't too close to the path. We were quite frightened last time when we faced them, so I definitely recommend avoiding them if you can. You weren't impressed by that boat, were you? <laughs> Another thing you'll notice as we reach Bramoth Swing Bridge, one of my favourite swing bridges, is that all but the Bramoth lock coming up are electric and require a CRT key. The canals in Doncaster are also really wide compared to when we've travelled through Stourport and Langothland Canal by hire boat and they allow large vessels like the Exol Pride, which we've not come across yet, but we've seen it in many other people's YouTube videos, that it travels from Gull to Rotherham, making, I believe, one or two deliveries a week for oil products. And apparently, you know about it when it's going past. But before we get to the manual one further up, we usually like to take advantage of how quiet and close the Bramoth services are on the right. And we usually empty our toilet, fill water, and get rid of rubbish on the way back home. Oh, and I'll give you a quick view of our rear cratch cover, which has been holding up very nicely. With the rain coming, this actually ended up being our savior, but we were warned by neighbors on our marina to make sure you take it down before you go through tunnels, just in case you damage the framework. We've heard stories about people having to claim on their insurance. But if you're traveling as a couple and one of you likes to walk along the towpath and open the locks while the other one drives, you have to walk by road at this point because there's now private moorings up there and you can't get through the locked gate. And once you're through Bramoth, it's here where you need to make a decision to either go left towards Doncaster Town Centre on the River Dunn navigation, or right where we're heading this time towards a new junction canal, giving you options such as Leeds or Gaul to York. But as it's now evening, we decided to reverse and moor up for the night and take hands for his evening walk, but back through Bramoth and cut through to the Don Aqueduct, which you'll see us go through in the morning. Now the Don Aqueduct has large guillotine gates either side and they're used to stop the River Don from flooding the canal and nearby land. I also think it looks like a very exciting challenge for the lock picking lawyer or any other lock picker wanting to practice. And depending on which side you're moored up, you can actually do a loop walk because there's another bridge further down which is how we got back to our boat and we've done this many times. And after some rest, Let's show you the Don Aqueduct from another perspective. Quite a 
few times we've found kids jumping here from the top and they don't seem to realise how dangerous it is. And if they knew how many dead deer we'd seen in the canals, I'm sure they'd think twice. And if you're going in the same direction as us, towards the Air and Calder Canal, currently one of the requirements is that you need to book between Psych House Lock and Pollington Lock 48 hours in advance due to water levels. And they're only giving access once a day from 10 a.m. So we made sure we booked it both ways, but that meant we had to make sure we got back in time. But before we get there, let's have the second montage of the video because there were a lot of electric swing and lift bridges that we came across. <coughs> When we got just before Psych House Lock so we could wait there until the next morning, there were now four of us who were spaciously moored up. And it felt a really peaceful spot as it's not somewhere people walk and it seemed great for undisturbed picnics and barbecues. A little bit like waiting at an airport but camping. But we also had a lot of time to kill. So if you didn't catch last week's video, this is where I filmed fitting perfect fit blinds to our boat's windows. That's better. Also, one of the things that I love on this boat compared to being in a camper van is being able to cook family meals with space around you. And if I want to grab some milk to make a cup of tea on an evening, I don't have to move the bed out of the way. And I'm cooking one of our favourite meals, cheesy bacon and leeks. I'm not going to show you the whole recipe or anything, but if you fancy making it, there's a link in the description. On the morning of your departure, you've got to wait for a traffic light to turn green, which signals that it's okay to go into the lock. And the clouds around this time were not looking promising at all. And by the time we got through, we were at the back of the convoy and somehow didn't get the chance to return the favour of opening any upcoming bridges. And by the time we got to the Went Aqueduct, just before the Air and Calder, which appears to be a very popular fishing spot, we all turned left towards Leeds. And during this journey to Pollington Lock, which you have to book that point to get back, we've all got a two hour window slot to get there. I think I've read that you're not really allowed to moor in between. And I'm not sure what happened to the fourth boat though, because he didn't make it in time. And we did wait a while, just in case. But it was between this scene and the next, where we'd ended up being at the front of the convoy, but decided to pull up for dinner. And unexpectedly, by the time we got to the bridge at Great Heck, there were police stood there asking us to moor up. And it turned out, if we hadn't stopped for something to eat, we would have discovered a dead body in the canal. And because we were there for the rest of the day, I ended up using this time to finish editing my workshop organisation video. So all wasn't lost, but we later found out that the man was a fellow narrowboater who had a mooring at Whitley Lock. Anyhow, after some morning coffee, we're on our way again, but this time Whitley Lock. Next, we're heading towards Nottingley, and it was from this point of the holiday we were constantly looking for a safe place to moor up, near shops to buy fly spray and some form of mosquito killer. 
I'd already recycled two pot bottles making fly bait with vinegar, sugar, washing up liquid, following some recipes online. Unfortunately, nothing worked and we now had several bites, but I'll talk more on this later. You'll come across some history here, some 18th century bridges engineered with new. A prominent flour mill parallel to the towpath which I don't think is associated with Kings Mill, despite it being near Kings Mill Bridge. And once we got to Ferry Bridge, which isn't that far away, this is where we thought we'd pull up, looking for anti-fly provisions and stock up on a few things that we needed. But all we found were shops with very little on the shelves. And instead, we returned to face more electric locks and my husband's driving now for the next 30 minutes along a river giving me enough time to cook a yummy courgette and cauliflower soup to eat like cuppa soups. Again, recipe below. By the time we got to Castleford, this is where a random local expressed a concern that I was driving about and my husband must be brave for trusting me. I do wonder what he would have said if he saw me with a power tool in my hand. <laughs> we had another choice to either go straight on to Wakefield or right towards Leeds. We weren't really sure what we were gonna do at this point but the latter was more appealing because I used to work in this city on Albion Street and get the train there every morning from Doncaster. But I had to keep this river footage short and sweet because I still needed to do some video editing. So if you want to see what this part looks like, check out the timestamps below for the return journey. The first lock getting closer to Leeds is Lemonroid, which we shared with a cruiser but I didn't end up filming anything because I found it really throws you about. And not long after this, it absolutely chucked it down. So we thought it was best just to pull up for another night. I found Woodlesford Lock really quaint as well the next day. And that has moorings and some CRT services. And occasionally by the time we got to some locks, we'd have to pause our journey and wait for engineers to do essential lock maintenance, such as Fish Pond Lock here. This was another really peaceful area that we moored up on the way back. Then after a bit of traveling, it started to get more civilized and more interesting. If you've never been, Leeds is massive and it always changes every time I visit. So we're gonna have another montage. Montage! That's until we get to Leeds Dock, the last electric lock for a while. To this point you'll meet a river which I was surprised it's much quicker to travel by boat than it is on foot. And it's here where I found the smallest lock landing to pull up. But I didn't film any of opening this because it caught me out. I didn't know that I needed a windlass and a handcuff key. In fact, that goes for all of the locks and bridges from now on to Shipley. One of the reasons I was a little bit hesitant of going to Leeds is because it's busy. And I didn't like the idea of everyone watching me being a novice doing manual locks because I usually do the electric ones. But honestly, it was so busy that people weren't even looking at you. They were walking through in a rush, trying to get from A to B as fast as they could, and no one cared. And after a nice stretch, we came across our first staircase lock called Oddy Locks. And if you fancy a hire boat experience, there is a hire boat company just on the left here. And we finally found a Morrison's around here. So we finally stocked up on more food and fly spray. Thankfully, Forge Locks is manned 
because the volunteers said that the paddles don't always work properly. And once we'd got through, my husband also helped a hire boat couple who wanted to use it after us. So from this point, we buddied up with them, driving through Newley or Newley and Rodley, leading up to Appley, taking it in turns to open the swing bridges. I found this whole stretch really beautiful with loads of rural farmland around. On the way up to Shipley, we met various narrowboaters who warned us about this, that and the other en route and one being Dobson Locks, another staircase lock because two boats recently had their engine bay flooded with the leaking gates. So as a warning, I made sure that our front door was closed. But once we got up there, it was so peaceful, like finding a pot of gold. Another warning that we'd got from a lady in Leeds was how difficult the next idle swing bridge was to open, which is owned by Yorkshire Water, not CRT. And she said she'd fractured a pelvis trying to open it, and then her husband struggled to open it with her as well. She was not kidding. It felt like it took minutes to budge an inch. And once we'd got into Shipley, which is a few bridges down, we thought it's about time we should probably head back just in case we didn't make it to Pollington Lock in time. But I felt there was something sinister and wrong about the boat moored up on the right called Titus because it had a load of dried flowers laid on top. And it turned out three weeks prior another dead body had been found around this, which I suspect was the owner. Once we'd got past the electric bridge, there's a huge winding hole, and this is where I needed to turn around and start heading in the wrong direction. Shed face. Something that we notice about Leeds we're now near Calverley, by the way, is that there were an unbelievable amount of runners all day and all ages. It almost felt like everyone had received a memo saying, if you don't go for a run, you're all going to die. But I get it, it's such a lovely spot to walk, cycle or run. Now let's get back to those annoying flies and mosquitoes. Unlike our spring and winter high boat experiences, we didn't realize we'd get so many bites. We'd already been wearing skin so soft, spray ourselves liberally at night after a shower, but it would wear off through the night and we'd still get more bites. And I get a lot of emails from brands and I don't reply to most, but one of them was a PR company based in Leeds, asking if I'd like to review a fly killer called Nomad by Insectocuter. And they were kind enough to drop it off while we passed through Leeds Basin. So I'm gonna quickly talk about how it works and how we honestly found it. And of course, there's other ones available on the market. But it charges by USB, and it's collapsible with a green light to kill pests on top and a lamp at the bottom. We didn't need the lamp bit, so we didn't get to check its 16 hour life promise, which is for the lamp's dimmest setting. And although it's marketed as an outdoor fly killer, I thought it was perfect for hanging it around in various places of the boat, depending on where we were. But the most useful place was in the bedroom in front of a partially open porthole and we woke up to about 20 mosquitoes in the trap. It didn't last the full night. We sleep around seven to eight hours. I'm itching as I talk about this. But it does still work while it's charging. But one thing it didn't catch is any blue bottle flies. But they're more of an irritant that don't leave nasty bites. And I now can't settle without a trap in the bedroom. I'm not keen on Leeds Basin uh, mooring. That's hair raising. That daft little thing. Otherwise would have had to tighten the barrier. I don't even know if that's allowed. And on our way back, somewhere past Lemonroyd and Woodlesford, our Thetford toilet cassette was full and we couldn't find an Elson point for quite a while en route. Luckily, we took people's advice and bought a spare with a seat refresher. And the way people access their cassette is different on everyone's boat. We access ours in the bedroom under the bed. And there's a cupboard door leading to the back of the toilet. Then time for the toilet seat replacement.
and time for a bottle of fizz on the air and colder. Yay. Oh, oh, oh. That was real, Vicky. <laughs> I have to bleep that out. For the penultimate day, walked around Pollington and bought some fresh eggs for breakfast from an honesty box and actually managed an afternoon of sunbathing before going through Pollington and Psych House the next morning. And towards the end of each holiday now, my husband is obsessed with cleaning the boat with our Gifted Works Hydroshop Power Washer. I'll leave a link below, again, not sponsored, but the house part is perfect for dropping it into the canal and it's got a few different settings. Let me know if you want to see a review on this, but we found it really useful because our marina doesn't allow us to use fresh water to clean the boat. And it's not as strong as the Karcher pressure washer that we've got at home, which I'm relieved about because it can damage paintwork if you get too close, as you'll see in an upcoming car bonnet restoration video. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this one and I'll catch you in a DIY video. Thanks for watching. Bye.